What's going on guys? Welcome back to the channel. My name is Mark and this is 360 Finance. In today's video, we're going to be going over if the stock market is going to crash in 2021. In 2020, we saw one of the fastest market crashes in history, seeing the Dow Jones or the S&P 500 drop nearly 34% in I think 33 days it was. And that resulted in the Federal Reserve reducing interest rates to essentially zero and saying that they're going to remain there for the foreseeable future. So on top of that, there has been tons of vaccine progress this year and uh, most North Americans will be able to take the vaccine within the next six months. The question still remains whether uh, we are going to see demand return for some of these industries that have been extremely hard hit by the coronavirus, such as the airline industry, such as the restaurant industry. So in particular, in this video, we're going to be going over a variety of data. We're going to be getting a market recap of 2020. We're going to be getting a Joe Biden message as to whether or not he's going to have a national shutdown. We're gonna go over the original Warren Buffett indicator. We're gonna go through consumer confidence, global GDP forecasts, a lot to come in this video. Video, so make sure you stay till the end to hear my final thoughts. Just a reminder, I would like to let you guys know that over 90% of people who actually watch this content aren't actually subscribed to the channel. If you do enjoy this type of content, please at least consider subscribing as it does help me out quite a bit and I do appreciate it. Also feel free to reach out to me on any social media and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Let's go ahead and get into the video. The S&P 500 index year to date, obviously we had that big crash once the coronavirus kind of took over our economy, but it's actually rebounded and resurged above those levels that we saw pre-March, which kind of begs people to ask, you know, is this market overvalued again? And are we going to see some form of correction or market crash? If we look at the TSX year to date, it hasn't actually resurged back to the same levels that we were seeing back in February, March, 2020, which kind of indicates to me that the US market in particular might be a little bit more overvalued than the Canadian. Uh, these are the two proxy indexes that I use just because I live in North America. Now I want to show you guys a clip of Joe Biden, uh, which he spoke publicly again about the coronavirus and what his plan would be once he takes office. Scientists you know, you keep Everybody asks that question every single time I stand here. It was a hypothetical question. The answer was I would follow the science. I am not going to shut down the economy, period. I'm going to shut down the virus. That's what I'm going to shut down. So that's I'll say out. again, no national shutdown. No national shutdown. Because every region, every area, every community is, can be different. And mm -hmm. so there's no circumstance which I can see would require a total national shutdown. I think that would be counterproductive. In particular, he talked about how there would never be a nation or a national shutdown is the words that he used. You know, every region, every area and every community can be different. So there's no circumstance that he sees which they require a total national shutdown. Another thing that people typically like to point out is that if Joe Biden actually takes office that we will see another market crash. So I do have some data here just to show you actually how the S&P and what its total return was under every single president. And you can see here that the market under Democrats actually does not perform worse than it does under Republicans, which is a common myth. In fact, Donald J. Trump here is sitting at about 43% S&P return to date, whereas uh, the total eight year tenure of Barack Obama, it saw a return of 182%. Trump in particular has stayed pace with uh, George W. Bush, um, but definitely underperformed the to two most recent uh, Democratic presidents, as you can see see outlined by this graph here. The next graph that I want to show you guys is the classic Warren Buffett indicator, the Wilshire 5000 to GDP ratio. And this is important because if you think about it, the stock market in reality shouldn't have a higher market cap than the GDP ratio just because that is the total number of goods sold and produced in a given country. So you can see here it's been well over one since you know 2015 but it has surpassed you know all-time levels and this is as high as it's ever been dating back to you know the the financial crisis as well as the tech bubble of the early 2000s sitting as high as 1.72 right now. The reason I show this indicator is because I believe heavily in a theory known as reversion to the mean okay. So this is a very simple, simple explanation, but basically also known as regression to the mean is this statistical phenomenon stating that the greater the deviation of a random variate from its mean, the greater probability that the next measured variate will deviate less far. In other words, an extreme event is likely to be followed by a less extreme event. This ties into the S&P 500 over the GDP index, okay? So if we look at the past 30 years here, whenever there was any type of marginal decrease in GDP, 
And as we all know, there is a significant decrease in GDP this year. There tends to be a big drop in the stock market. Now, we all know that there has been negative GDP forecasts for basically the entire world this year. If you just look at this data from the World Bank here, the only country that is not forecasting negative growth in GDP is actually China and Indonesia. Every other country, in particular the advanced economies, US, the Euro area, and Japan, all have negative or huge negative forecasts. In particular, if you look at commodity prices, and this ties into how you know the Canadian economy is doing, you can see the extremity of the effects on its price right here, negative uh, 47.9. Anyways, another important thing to take into account is the number of tangible versus intangible assets in companies. And in particular, this feeds into the outperformance that we've seen in the tech sector as of most recently. And you can see here that as a percentage of total assets, intangible assets, are almost 90% of all total assets for companies within the S&P 500. Not only is this a historical high, it's a nod to just how prevalent technology has become in our lives. Intangible assets are holdings that don't carry any physical or financial embodiment. This includes R&D, intellectual property, and computer computerized information such as data and software. While they're often difficult to value due to certain accounting practices today, and that's kind of what I want to explain here. When, let's say, Microsoft creates Excel or Microsoft Microsoft Office and has a patent for that. How do you actually value that? How many people are going to be buying that and on a recurring basis? And how many people are likely to, you know, share that with a friend? Or how many people are likely to use that to monetize other software? These intangible assets are extremely, extremely hard to value and they continue to become a larger portion of the total assets in terms of the major companies on the S&P 500 and just worldwide. Now, if if any of you don't already know how GDP is calculated, it's calculated through this formula. Consumption plus government spending plus investment plus net exports, okay? And that is what's known as the expenditure approach, which is primarily how the US GDP is calculated. There's a couple other approaches as well, which you may uh, learn uh, if you are taking the CFA program. There's also the production approach as well as the income approach, but we're going to be talking about the expenditure approach. And in particular, where this has impact into what I'm talking about in terms of a large portion of total assets being intangible is consumption. When these tech companies come up with some sort of proprietary you know, software and sell it to you, what's the value that they assign to that software? And is it recurring? And how much revenue can you expect from a consumer to pay into that software or data? And this is what's driving up essentially GDP as well as the stock market. In essence, consumers spend money to acquire goods and services such as groceries and haircuts, or like I'm saying, intangible assets. And consumer spending is generally the largest component of GDP, counting for more than two thirds of the US GDP. Therefore, consumer confidence has a very significant bearing on future economic growth. If we just look at GDP for the US, you can see kind of nice lines straight up here. There has been a few dips in history, in particular the 2008 financial crisis and this year with the coronavirus. If you look at Canada's, it's a little bit different you know it's a little bit more uh, up and down as our economy is more tied to natural resources than the US and as we know most of the major tech companies in North America are in the US and not Canada last pieces of data I want to show you here is just the consumer confidence levels and you can see here the last time consumer confidence was this low wasn't really back until like 2011 okay so we certainly haven't recovered and seen a recovery in or people don't believe that our economy is going to be coming roaring back this indicator currently sitting below 80 right now and before the coronavirus it was sitting closer to 100 same thing with canada except canada's has actually never been this low since we didn't uh, or weren't the major drivers of the world financial crisis our consumer confidence actually never went that low back in you know 2010 2011 in particular with canada and the u.s consumer confidence continues to remain a concern all right so i hope you guys enjoyed most of that data uh, and uh, ultimately, here's my thoughts, okay? Uh, nobody knows whether the stock market is going to go up or down in 2021. I don't think anybody knew that the coronavirus was going to drop the stock market over 30% this year. It's always important to be prudent and invest for the long term and never try to time the market because uh, you never know what's going to happen next. And even the experts on this planet, the so-called experts, uh, have absolutely no idea what's going to happen next. So just make sure to stay invested. Make sure you're managing your risk appropriately. Make sure you're looking at your own financial situation and investing appropriately. You know, one investment for somebody isn't necessarily suitable 
for somebody else. A high growth investment, for instance, which has a lot of a risk associated with it is likely not going to be in somebody's investment portfolio who's near retirement, whereas it's much more likely to be in someone's portfolio who just turned 20. Anyways, that's basically all I have for you guys today. If you did enjoy, please don't forget to smash the like button, subscribe to the channel if you enjoyed, and share the video if you learned something, okay? I will see you guys in the next video.